Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club episode 34, which is hard to believe. Um, and uh, we hope you're all doing well. And a big warm welcome, especially to members out there who are watching. And today is exciting because we are welcoming back a return guest, uh, Dr. Jack Dumbacher, who is our curator of ornithology and mammalogy, also known as birds and mammals. Um, hi, Jack. So glad that you agreed to come back. Thanks for having me. No, it's great to be back. Yeah, last time um, you talked to us about the owls of the Pacific Northwest, and this time we're going in a slightly different direction. Can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be talking about today? Uh, way further west, we're going to go across the Pacific to the island of New Guinea, which is a, a place that I um, started doing work when I was a graduate student, and I fell in love with New Guinea, and I got bitten by a poisonous bird there. And, um, and so, uh, and I'll tell you all about it in today's talk. Okay, I'll try to resist asking asking questions because I know this, this story is like a really good one. Um, are you going to talk about the difference between poisonous and venomous or should we get that out of the way now? I'm not going to be talking about that, but it's an, it's an interesting distinction because we, ha we have a, um, an exhibit coming up called Venom. That's right. And we didn't really get to feature the poisonous birds because they're not venomous. So animals that are venomous actually inject their toxins. So think of things like rattlesnakes that have fangs or, or wasps and bees that have stingers and they're able to inject their, their toxin. Um, but there's lots of other things that are poisonous, but they don't inject it. And think of things like poison dart frogs. You know, they have it on the outside of their body and it's mostly to protect them from something that would eat them like monarch butterflies, things like that. And poisonous birds are that kind of poisonous. They're not venomous. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I, when I was looking back at our last Breakfast Club, we talked a little bit about how, or maybe I mentioned that you teach master birding classes. Um, and there was a question there we never actually got to, which is, um, what is it, what is it, what do you have to um, have or do expert or know expertise wise to teach a master birding class and how might someone take one with you? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, I would say that none of the teachers actually have all the skills or, or I guess, you know, we, we, there's three of us who teach the class. Um, and, and I'm an ornithologist, so I'm kind of like the professional scientist guy. And, and we have the collections at the academy, which is, are an amazing asset to be able to use in teaching. And then we have uh, Eddie Bartley. And, and he is, um, gosh, what is he? He's, he's an amazing birder but he's also an amazing photographer and, um, and he leads trips professionally. And, um, and so he's a great trip leader. He's really good outdoors. And, um, and we, and this year for the first year, we've, we've got a new teacher, Bruce Mast. And we, we had another teacher who just retired from the master birding program and Bruce has taken over and I'm still getting to know Bruce, but, but Bruce is an amazing guy and a very clear linear thinker and really good at bird identification. So when, when something pops up, he'll like be bang and tell you exactly what it is and why it is what it is and what we see that helps us distinguish what it is, whether it's its posture, its song, it's the colors that you see, where it is in the habitat, all these different things. And he helps put all that stuff together. And I think, um, and, and to be a master birder, and one of the things was we all sort of said, oh, I'd like to teach this. And, you know, and he said, well, I'd like to teach this. And Bruce is like, well, I'd like to make sure this is part of the curriculum. And before you knew it, we had a program that was so involved that I didn't know if anyone was going to sign up for it. I thought no one's going to be crazy enough to, <laughs> to do this. And in fact, we've packed the class for um, I think this is our sixth or maybe even seventh year running. And, um, and people usually come to the class as pretty good birders. But really, the goal of the class is to make them environmental leaders. And so they, they have to lead trips. They have to take trips and learn the birds. But they have to, you know, they basically learn the ornithology lectures that I gave when I helped teach at Berkeley. And, um, and then they, they get to, to work with the specimens in their hands and, you know, see that history, but also the, the real birds. And, and, you know, they have to lead their own trips. They have to give lectures. They have to write a paper, they have to do a breeding bird survey, they have to know how to take notes, they have to do all this other stuff and, and plus a hundred hours of volunteer um, work that they put in over the course of two years to get their certificate. Um, and when they're done, they are master birder students. I'm really proud of them. They go on to do amazing things and a lot of them are board members for different NGOs. One of them has his own radio program. A lot of them write and they have their own blogs. One of them's writing a book now. And I think, you know, you do all these things and it empowers you and you feel confident to, 
to take the next leap and to become a real leader in the community. And I think that's the fun thing that we've got going. Plus that's it's really, really cool. yeah, and it's fun to go birding. It's a year long course too. Um, yeah, and, that's a pretty serious commitment. Yeah, so if you're, and if you're interested, we usually advertise it in December and the class starts in February and it's a first come first serve. So once the signups are all taken and there's usually 20 slots per year. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to teach it next year. We're not sure because this COVID thing has really shut us down this year. And, um, sure. and we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna get all the students um, from this year through and make sure that they get all the field time that they need. So we might spill right. over into next year. And so we're not sure how that's gonna affect next year's class, but we really hope we'll be able to offer it again next year. So thanks for asking. Yeah, that's a fun absolutely. Thing that we do. Yeah, it's so interesting too, because I mean, birds inspire such passion. You know, they're, I think about like, in terms of the, in terms of like non-scientists or non professional time professional scientists who have an area of an expertise, like birders are, I mean, they're kind of legendary everywhere for having, you know, life lists and all of these other things. And it's hard to think about another group of animals that inspires, you know, beyond so many people beyond those who become uh, full-time experts. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's not like yeah. legions of people signing or like out there watching tiny mice or these sorts of things. Yeah, well, mice are active at night, you know, birds are so accessible because they're active at day and they have big eyes and they're visual like we are and, you know, and, and they're right in your backyard. And so whether you live in the city or the country, there's everyone can get, you know, get involved with birds and watch them and love them. So, yeah. Um, thank you for saving me as I kind of trailed off there. I was trying to think of a particularly good example of something that wasn't a bird and I sort of failed, but let's get into some of these <laughs> um, less, or some of these more exotic birds or the birds that people certainly won't have seen in their backyards. Um, I'm going to give you your slides and viewers, cool. um, a reminder that you can ask Jack questions at any time. If you're watching on Facebook, just leave them in comments. If you're watching on YouTube, just leave them in chat and um, I'll get out of here and let, um, let uh, Jack take us through his presentation, but we will come back at the end and ask as many of them as we can. So enjoy, and Jack, thank you so much again, and we'll see you at the end. Thanks, Laura. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, so, I, you know, this is one of my favorite projects that I've been working on for a very long time. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about poisonous birds and other stories from New Guinea field work. So first of all, let's start, like, like where is New Guinea? So New Guinea is that little island. Um, it's actually the second largest island in the world. So it's a pretty big island just north of Australia. And it's at the Eastern end of the Indonesian archipelago and on the Western side of the Pacific. So right across the Pacific from where we are. And it's almost right on the equator. It's just South of the equator. So it's, it's entirely tropical and it's, warm and you know there's an amazing amount of forest still if you look at it about 74 percent of it is still forested and so it has um, some of the largest continuous expanses of of tropical for anywhere outside of the end um, and that rainforest is in great condition um, and you know, if you if you look at it, this is a village that I'll talk a little bit more about later in the talk. But it's it's incredibly rugged, and that's another thing that's kind of protected it, and protected a lot of the people who who live in these forests too. And if if you can imagine, you know, a place like this, right on the tropics, with all these amazing forests, and of course there are going to be a lot of amazing animals too. And so, because I study birds, the birds are the things I know the most, and that I have photos of and want to talk about. So some of the cool birds from New Guinea include the smallest parrots in the world. This is a yellow cap pygmy parrot and its body is about the size of your thumbs. So it's a tiny, tiny little parrot. On the spectrum, the largest bird is the southern cassowary, the is the dwarf cassowary. The only birds in the world that are larger than the cassowary is ostrich, the ostrich from uh, Africa. And cassowaries are way better looking anyway. Um, then, there, then if we want to talk about good looking birds, the birds of paradise are really second to none in the world. This is a magnificent bird of paradise in my hand here. And you can see it's amazing colors. They also do incredible dances. And um, there are 40, depending upon how you count them, 43, 46, or 100 birds of paradise um, in New Guinea. And they really look very different. So here's on the, on the lower left, this is the, the kingbird of paradise, which is a 
fairly close relative of the Magnificent that I just showed you. And then the Rajana Bird of Paradise, which is actually the, uh, the national bird of New Guinea, of Papua New Guinea. And I went to New Guinea um, as a volunteer field assistant to study Rajana Birds of Paradise. And we were really interested in, in how the, these mating displays evolve um, because they're really elaborate and many, many males will sit in a tree and dance for one female and then the female gets to decide who she mates with. And so in order to study them, we had put, um, we were trying to put uh, color bands on all of the males so that we could see who was who and what was happening in the tops of the trees when they were doing all their dances. So we had many, many nets up in the forest and, and one of my jobs was to run those nets and to let all the birds go except for the birds of paradise and then we would put color bands on them and, and take a blood sample and then let them go. And so another one of the coolest birds in New Guinea is this one, the hooded pitahui, one of the birds that I caught when I was studying these Rajiana birds of paradise. And as you can see, the tip of its bill is hooked and very, very sharp. And they're about the size of a blue jay in North America. And they have strong claws too. So when you're taking them out of the net, they'll, they'll claw at you and, and scrape your hands. And the cuts really sting because you're in the tropics, you're sweaty, you've got, you know, insect repellent on. And so, you know, what you do after you get cut by a hooded pitahui is you pop your finger in your mouth and you lick your cut and you, and you go on to the next net. And if you do this after handling a hooded pitahui, your mouth begins to tingle and burn and then go numb. And this happened to me and I realized there's something really weird about this bird. And after it happened a second time, I realized the only thing that the two experiences had in common was that I was handling the hooded pitahui's. And uh, so I asked the local folks, our local guides, I said, what do you guys know about these hooded pitahuis? And he said, oh, oh, those are poisonous birds and you shouldn't be touching them. You should leave those birds alone and, and focus on birds of paradise because birds of paradise are much cooler. And I said, no, no, these hooded pitahuis are pretty interesting and I've never heard of a, of a poisonous bird before. So we looked into it and, and at the time we thought these were the only poisonous birds in the world. It turns out there may be some others, but that's a topic of another breakfast club that we'll have to do in the future sometime. Um, but so, so I became interested in hooded pitahuis and I wanted to study them scientifically. So um, what does that mean? So when you think about, you know, what does a scientist do? A scientist asks a lot of questions and is trying to create knowledge where there is no knowledge already. And what kinds of questions can you, can you begin to answer? Well, some of the first ones um, in the upper left there is the chemistry of the toxins. You might ask, what are the chemicals that are involved? Um, you might also ask about the physiology. And we're just gonna go around here and clockwise and just highlight some of the kinds of questions you can begin to ask. But this is all terra incognita at this point, right? So we've discovered this thing is poisonous. The local people all know about it, um, but, you know, but scientifically we know almost nothing. So we can ask about the physiology. We can ask about the source of the toxin. Do the birds produce it themselves? Or are they getting it from something else and just rubbing it on their feathers? We could ask about the evolution. How did it evolve? Um, are other closely relative, re related species also poisonous? And, and do they evolve mimicry and bright coloration like so many other things that are poisonous? You can ask about the function of the betrachia toxin. Is it, is it a chemical defense? Is it the protection against parasites or predators? Or is it just a secretion of some other function? You can develop it. Um, does it come, do animals are really babies like eggs or, or as they're growing or only as adults? And how does it get into the feathers and how does it get into the tissues and, and so on and so forth? So these are some of the questions that we began um, mulling over in our minds and designing experiments to go out and answer. So back to New Guinea we went. So what I want to talk a little bit about is, is what does it mean to do work in, in a place like New Guinea? And what does that look like? Because it's not like just, you know, getting up in the morning and going out to the local nature preserve out, you know, outside of our neighborhoods here in California. New Guinea is a really rugged place uh, and there's very few roads. So to get to the different places that we need to go, we usually either have to fly by fixed wing aircraft. And this is me sitting in the co-pilot seat um, from a little missionary aviation air, aircraft coming into a, um, the Wabo airstrip. The other way that we get along is around is by boat on rivers like this river here, the Purari River. Um, and sometimes when we're on the coast, we might take a sailboat or another kind of boat and call into ports at sea. Um, and then once you get to a village, 
And here we were after we landed in Wabo and a lot of the people from the village came out and they, you know, they came out to the plane to get their mail and to send produce back to their friends in, in cities, you know, but they're also like, well, who are these folks and what did they come here for? So we sit down with them and we'll talk to them about what we're there to do and seek permission. And this can take, you know, from several hours to a few days, depending upon, um, you know, who's in charge and what's it going to take take to get permission and how much interest there is in the work. And so we would walk back to the village and here's a very typical Highland village. This is uh, the village of Harawana. And um, we would walk back to the village and, and talk with folks about what we plan to do and sit down with the elders and their families and, and some of the councilmen, the chiefs, and, uh, and talk about what it is we're there to do and, and what we hope to learn and what it's going to take. And can we buy some produce to feed ev everybody and how many people we might need to hire and so on and so forth and try and get their permission. And if they're willing and interested, then, then it's a go and we're going to all do some work. And we usually um, will stay in a village for several weeks or a couple of months. Um, um, and in some cases, I stayed in villages for, for several months. And, uh, and then we're able to, to get a little bit of work done. And then, you know, if the local folks aren't that interested or we're not welcome, we can usually tell that right away. And then we wait for the next plane or the next boat and we go on to another place where we might be um, welcome. And then so in, a, in, in Wabo, we were welcome and we had a really great time. So the next thing we did was we we um, we hired a few of the local folks as guides and they were able to take us to their gardens and the spots where they thought the, the birds would be where we could um, learn a lot about the birds. And we got in boats and we were able to to get in these boats and go up the river to, to a place where we could call camp. Oftentimes instead we're, we're hiking, especially if it's mountainous and the rivers are a little bit more treacherous. Um, we end up hiking overland to get to our spots. And then when we find the camp where the local folks say, yeah, this is the spot we wanted to take you. And, um, and then they'll build a camp. So here, the, here are some of the men and they're, they're building some tables where we can work, where we can set up our equipment and some of our tools. And, um, and, and we can write and sit and you can see that there's a lot of, um, there's some blue tarps above us to keep the rain off of us because it can be very wet in New Guinea. We kind of joke that there's a wet season and a wetter season in New Guinea. There's no dry season in New Guinea. Um, and the, the tent in the back that is white kind of to the back and, and, um, and to the left is where we uh, is where we slept, and the the men would make beds very similar to these. And again, we would do whatever the local folks think is the is the right way to sleep. Some places we like to sleep on the ground. Sometimes, uh, in in this particular village, there were too many snakes and other things, and they're like, no way, we're not sleeping on the ground. So we made beds for everybody. We also had a little cook cookhouse, and this is the the cookhouse with a bench to sit and a place to store some food and a little fire that we kept going. So we always had some hot water and and some food going. And then we were able to set up our camp and set nets and begin catching birds. And we would catch a lot of other birds besides the pitahuis. And I'll just run down some of the beautiful birds in New Guinea that we would encounter, like this Papuan dwarf kingfisher. And oftentimes when we would, would get these birds, we would be able to take some blood samples that we could use for, for other studies. Um, and then here's a sacred kingfisher um, along the coast and a red-capped flower pecker, beautiful little um, bird from New Guinea, spectacle, which is here. It, it's New Guinea. The so yield build keeper um, with them and how they have speciated in New Guinea. Um, here's an azure kingfisher. So you can see there's a lot of kingfishers in New Guinea with that, that really long bill. They often will follow waterways and eat fish, but do a lot of cool things too in the forest. Here's a monarch. Um, and there are several really nice species of pigeons in New Guinea. This is a, a giant imperial pigeon that you find out in the island provinces. And here's a white bibbed fruit dove. There are many of these big stocky um, pigeons that you find that feed on fruits in the forest trees. There's a beet fisher. Only on any. All right, I'm sorry. This is um, insects that look like leaves and insects that look like nothing but insects. 
And if we're lucky, catch some pitahuis and we can begin our work studying poisonous birds. And so this is the southern variable pitahui, then is the hooded pitahui. And these are the these are the poisonous birds. And so once we realized that these birds were poisonous, we were able to get permission to collect a couple of these. And we were able to um, collect the feathers and some and skins that we knew were also poisonous. And we were able to bring these back. And we worked with chemists at the next and health for actually a couple of years to try and figure out what the chemicals were that were involved in the toxicity of the, of the birds. And after a couple of years of work, we discovered that these toxins were known and that they're called vitrecotoxins. Um, it took a lot of fancy chemistry that our colleagues were able to do. It's a steroid because the four rings that you see in the lower left part of this molecule um, are draw drawn and because it's a nitrogen that's in a ring that that ring in the middle there um that gives it um, the the alkaloids um and so we were able to make it very pure and that helped us to, to figure out what the toxin was and the last word there is the neurotoxin neurotoxin means nerve poison and it's a nerve poison because it attacks voltage gated sodium our nerves and muscle membranes we have these sodium channel close and it's the opening and closing of the sodium channel that causes the electrical that goes down that sends the sends the sodium and that causes the nerve to fire or the muscle to fire. So toxin binds to the sodium channel. And once it fires, it holds it in information and prevents, um, that actually prevents itself from establishing the or moving of the sodium to one side so that it can fire a second time. So it'll fire once and then it gets shut off. And so this basically causes numbness and tingling sensation. And at higher concentrations, it can cause death because it, set, it shuts down your entire nervous system and shuts down your heart, which also has the, the, um, the sodium channels and, and your muscles. And it turns known because it takes very few of those channels to be open to depolarize the, the, or the muscle entirely. And, um, those sodium channels are so highly conserved across the animal kingdom um, that we would in, in studies that have been done almost all animals with um with sodium channels from insects all the way up to humans um are affected by trachotoxin toxins were previously known in traco toxin means frog poison traco meaning frog in greek and so these were genus and in fact they're over Poison frogs in their beautiful blues and green. But of all the so called poison dart frogs, only three species were ever actually used by the Choco and Mbet Indians of Central and South America to poison dart tips. And those are Phyllobates aritania in the upper right, and Phyllobates bicor in the center, Phyllobates down in the bottom. Frogs so poison. poisons at pitahuis. Other interesting things to note about these one is that found only in Central and South America, and the toxic ones are restricted to the Western Colombian lowlands. And so that suggests that, you know, the, the birds aren't, the pitahui birds from New Guinea are not getting the toxins from these frogs. So the birds in New Guinea are an independent case of the big Diet. When you they slowly lose toxicity of their rate them toxin captivity, they readily accumulate those toxins. So they probably get it from their diet, but we've never been able to find source of toxins, even though the source of some of the other frog poisons has been found in, in ants and millipedes and other things. The patricotoxins have besides the frogs and the birds. Um, three, 
to have specialized skin glands that they use to store the toxin and they can exude the toxin in a milky substance when they're, when they're agitated or threatened. And most of those, um, or I should say the, these skin glands are more concentrated on the back and they're all over the skin. And so another thing that we wanna think about for the pitahuis is, well, where are the pitahuis storing the toxins or how are they, how are they using it, right? How are they, are they able to exude it in a similar way? And fourth, um, the frogs appear to be totally insensitive to the toxins. So like I mentioned, the, the pitahui ter or the phyllobates terribles has enough that just holding these frogs in your hand can kill you. And so the frogs have to have some mechanism not to be poisoned by these themselves. And so that's an area of the active research that um, some colleagues are working on. And, um, and that's a question that we wanna ask about the, the, uh, the birds as well. So here's a picture of that Phyllobates terribus, the most toxic of all the poison dart frogs, which has exactly the same poisons as the Pitahui birds. So now that we knew what the toxin was, okay, um, we had some tools that we could use to try and measure the amount of that toxin in different tissues. And that allowed us to do a very simple descriptive study to ask, well, how are the toxins distributed within an individual bird across different tissues? And there's a couple of different questions that we can answer. We can ask, um, where are the toxins stored? Are there particular places that have the toxins that they, they might be storing them, like the, the frogs have those specialized glands? And we knew that the toxin was in the feathers because we in, had encountered it in the feathers just from holding the pitahui birds. Um, but we also wanted to look at the saliva glands because that, you know, they do rub their saliva on their feathers and also the preen gland or the uropygial gland, which is on the rump of a bird, which produces oils that the birds use for conditioning their feathers. So those are two potential sources. We might also ask, well, you know, are pitahuis insensitive to the toxins? And we, all we have to do there is, is look and see if the toxins are in the tissues that are normally poisoned by vitreca toxins, um, that might tell us that the birds are in fact insensitive. Alternatively, the birds may just be collecting the toxins from something that they're eating and rubbing it into their feathers. And if that's the case, we might only see the toxins on the outside of the birds. We might also ask, well, are toxins gonna be useful for defense. So if most of the toxin is in the inside of the bird and you'd have to kill it to find out that it's very poisonous, well then that's not gonna be very useful as a chemical defense. So birds that are chemically defended would wanna have the toxins on the outside of them. So we can ask, you know, are the, are the toxins in, in the right places that they could be useful for defense? So to do this, um, again, we used our assay, which was called a radio ligand binding assay. And along the, the, the vertical axis here, you'll see something It says micrograms of vitregotoxin equivalents per gram tissue. All you need to know is that that's really our measure of tissue toxin concentration, okay? So the y-axis, the vertical axis tells us how toxic each of these tissues is and the x-axis shows the different tissues. So a few things to notice right away is that saliva glands and uropygial glands or the preen glands didn't even make it on the graph. So they were non-toxic. So the toxin is definitely in, in, not in the mouth or in the preen gland of the bird, okay? Next, I want you to look at heart, liver, and muscle because these are the tissues that have the sodium channels that are normally poisoned by the, the betrachea toxin. And what I want you to look at is even in muscle, there's only about three to four micrograms of vitrecotoxin per gram tissue on average in muscle. So it's relatively non-toxic compared to some of the other tissues. But to put this into perspective, 0 0.05 grams of vitrecotoxin, if injected into a mouse, will kill it within a minute, okay? That means that muscle has, that every gram of muscle in a 65 gram bird has enough poison to kill about a hundred mice, okay? So that suggests that, that muscle and, heart and, liver, and heart and liver are definitely protected, that somehow the, the birds have it in these tissues but are not being poisoned by it. So this suggests um, that they have evolved some mechanisms for dealing with the toxins and the toxins are internal. So they're not just rubbing them on the outside of their body. One of the last questions we wanted to get to is, are toxins actually available for defense? And, what we found was that the most toxic tissues or the, talk, or the tissues with the highest toxin concentrations were on the outside of the bird. So skin and feathers were the, mo the two most toxic tissues. And this is exactly where you would want it to be if you wanna protect yourself from, um, from a predator because those are the tissues that they're gonna come into contact with first, right? Okay, so then knowing that skin is the most toxic organ, 
we wanted to do some some studies. We worked with um, a skin expert, Gopi Menon, who's also a, a fellow of the Academy of Sciences. And we were able to do some really nice uh, transmission electron microscopy looking at skin. So here, the upper right where it's the lightest, that's actually the outside of a bird. Um, and then all those layers that you see there, the next layers in, um, that's the, the top of the skin. And then underneath the skin, um, you can see some of the other um, things, some of the different cells going on. But what we found in short was that birds, pitahuis, like other birds, do not have any oil glands or sweat glands in their skin. So birds don't, don't have any of those things. And they, they regulate their, their oil in different ways, and they regulate their, their body temperature in different ways. And that pitahuis are like all other birds in that respect. So they did not have any special organs um, for storing or exuding the toxins. However, what we did find was that the toxins tend to be concentrated in these little things called multigranular bodies. And that's, an, that's an, a, an area that we're actively studying to try and figure out how the birds are able to actively move the toxins into the multigranular bodies without getting it in the skin in general, and, and whether that might be um, one of the mechanisms that they use to protect themselves. Um, so... Now, now that so that so those are some of the important questions that we were able to, to answer about about that and suggesting also that the birds may be using the, the toxins for defense and we want to begin thinking about that. Um, next, we might ask how are toxins distributed among different species or among individuals at different localities. And there are a couple of different questions that we wanted to get at with this. So first of all, when we first realized that the birds were, were toxic and we published the first paper, Several of our colleagues who work in New Guinea wrote to us and said, oh, that's so cool that you know this because I'm an anthropologist and the folks where I work all know about this too. And, and they have these you know, cool uses for pitahuis or they do these cool things or they avoid them. Um, and other people wrote to us and said, you know, I've worked in New Guinea for a long time and I've never heard that pitahuis are poisonous. And, and I doubt that it's a real phenomenon. Maybe it was just some weird thing that you found. Um, in a couple of locations. And so, so we became interested in the question, well, is toxicity really widespread or is it a local phenomenon? And this might help us locate the toxin source because many things that are poisonous actually get their toxin from food that they eat. Think of things like the monarch butterfly and they're reared on milkweeds, milkweed plants. And the monarch larvae um, it, depending upon whether they are reared on a toxic milkweed or a non-toxic milkweed, the adults might end up being toxic or non-toxic. So this may be the case with pitahuis too. So it may suggest that they're getting their toxins from something that they eat and that we might be able to figure out what the source is by finding places that are toxic and non-toxic and then seeing what those differences are. Another question that we had that we could answer with this study is, are all the species of pitahuis toxic? Um, because at the time there were six different species described as pitahuis and, um, and some of them were brightly colored and those are the ones that we knew were toxic and some of them were pretty drably colored. So we wanted to know whether all of the pitahuis were toxic. And um, so at this point we had a, a very nice assay for, for testing for toxicity and we knew that most of the toxicity was in the skin and feathers. So we could sample very broadly by just collecting a handful of feathers from different birds and then surveying the, t the toxicity of these feathers. And so that's what we did. And we were able to, to visit a whole bunch of different localities, over 16 different localities, collecting feather samples from these different species of pitahuis and a few other non-toxic um, relatives. So note here that the hooded pitahui and variable pitahui are the two most brightly colored species um, and two that we knew were toxic. And we also had, in our early pub publications, we also had some samples from the rusty pitahui and the crested pitahui, which also tested toxic. So we wanted to include the black pitahui and the white-bellied pitahui and get enough samples that we could actually see um, if there were differences between those different species. So here's a graph that sort of summarizes those data. Again, on the vertical axis, you'll see our tissue toxin concentration, so micrograms of petrachea toxin per gram of feather. On the x-axis, you'll see 16 different localities that we visited, and these are the different village names um, of the places that we visited. And then on the on that last axis, you'll see the names of the different pitahuis. So now if you kind of like skew your vision and you look down the, the bird axis at the different birds, we can summarize it like this. And what you see here is that um, the hooded and variable pitahui are clearly the two most toxic species. 
Um, and the rusty black and crested pitahui are much less toxic, but still detectable. And the white-bellied pitahui, actually, we weren't able to detect any toxins. So they appeared to be non-toxic, at least in the areas where we um, were able to, to collect feather samples. So now let's try and put this into perspective. Um, so for example, the, the variable in hooded pitahui, in almost every locality we went, if you pluck a single feather and you pop it on your tongue, it causes your mouth to burn and tingle. Um, and some places that sensation would last for several hours or even overnight. And, um, you know, some, some folks would, would say, oh, is it like, is it distasteful or is it a painful sensation? And I wouldn't say it's, it, I'd say it's, it's very unpleasant. And it's a lot like putting a nine volt battery on your tongue if you've ever done that. So it's a tingling sensation, but kind of an unpleasant electrical tingling. And if you get a lot of it or a very toxic feather, it, it can actually make your mouth go numb. Um, and so it, it's pretty unpleasant sensation. Um, the rusty black and crested pitahui, we are never able to taste it on the feathers. Um, but if you actually, you know, bring those birds into the laboratory, you can detect the, the levels of toxin in the skin and in, in the internal organs. So you would expect that if, if a predator ate them, it might get enough of them to, to get that unpleasant sensation, but maybe not from a single feather. Okay, so there really are these two different toxin classes. In fact, this prompted us to do a phylogenetic study and look at the relationships of these birds. And it turns out that the hooded and variable pitahui are, are very close relatives, but the rusty pitahui is actually more closely related to a shrike thrush. And the black pitahui actually belongs to a group of birds called whistlers. And the crested pitahui actually um, is related to the bellbird of Australia. So it's almost like these birds all evolved and they converged on, on um, getting toxins and becoming poisonous and doing pitahui-like things, even though they, they you know, evolved it independently. That also suggests that either a lot of birds are poisonous or that maybe these birds are getting it from their food. Okay, so that's another suggestion that they might be getting it from their diet. Okay, now, so that was one angle, but the other angle is looking across localities. And we wanted to ask, well, you know, are, are these birds poisonous everywhere? And so um, what I want you to see here is that every place where there's a little block, it's telling you how toxic the bird is in that locality. And wherever you don't see a block, it's simply because that bird species didn't occur at that locality. So, you know, some of these localities are too high in elevation or too low in elevation, or it's not the right force type, and you just don't get those birds. But if you look, at the back row there, the hooded pitahuis in purple, what you'll see is that there is a lot of variation from place to place. And in some places they're very, they're very toxic and in some places they're much less toxic. Same is true with the variable pitahui. In some places there's a lot of toxin and in some places very little. And just to, just to put this into perspective, in those places where the hooded or variable pitahuis were the most toxic, um, in some places just taking them out of the nets would cause your eyes to water and your nose to run. And it would cause you to have those symptoms for like a day or two. And the local people would say, they say, oh yeah, we're allergic to those birds. Those birds will, will you know, cause an allergic reaction because it's very much like hay fever, right? So that's, those, are, those birds are very, very poisonous. And in places where you, know, where you see a much smaller box, it's, it's more like the, you know, the, the rusty pitahui or black pitahui where we don't taste it in the feathers, but we can, we can detect it in the laboratory. So that too suggests um, that, you know, they might be getting it from, from, um, from food and, and the availability of the toxins might vary from locality to locality. So one other bit of information that we also had, which suggested that they may be getting it from food is this bird, the blue cap Frida. So I mentioned earlier that we often go to villages and we'll sit down with the local folks and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk to them about what we're there to do. And we say, yeah, we come, we've come to study poisonous birds. And, and they'll say, oh, okay, well, which ones? And we'll say, well, which ones have you got? And then they'll tell us you know, about these different poisonous birds that they have. And they almost always you know, talk about the pitahuis. They all know that pitahuis are poisonous so that they shouldn't be eaten. But the afrita was another bird that locals almost everywhere told us, oh, yeah, these birds are poisonous too. And in some cases, even more poisonous than, than the pitahuis. And, um, and these birds are totally unrelated to, to the other, to the pitahuis and they, and they look different, they act different. And so this too suggests um, that they may be getting it from the same source. And so, um, so the data that we had on localities plus the information about these other birds being poisonous 
all suggested that maybe the birds are getting it from some other source. And so we wanted to begin thinking about the possibility that the birds might be getting it um, from something that they're eating in their diet. And so every time we would go to New Guinea, we would always try and do, you know, other studies that would give us information um, that was publishable on those particular questions, but that would also help us find, you know, what the toxin source was. But that's a really tough nut to crack because um, the environment in New Guinea is so biodiverse and birds like pitahuis will eat everything. They're, you know, they're jays, they're like jays or small crows, they're omnivorous and they, they eat they eat berries and fruits and seeds. They eat small vertebrates like frogs. They eat insects, um, tiny insects and giant insects. And so, you know, th that makes it really hard to nail down where they may be getting the food, uh, where they may be getting the toxin. So we always worked on that, but we never knew if we were ever going to be able to figure it out. The next question that we wanted to tackle was, well, can toxins protect pitahuis from their enemies? So we knew that the toxins are on the outside of the birds in the feathers and in the skin where you know a lot of the enemies of birds will come into contact with it and th and then this begs the question well what enemies are we talking about here you know what enemies might a toxin protect you from and there are lots of different ones to think about and one i'm going to suggest is ectoparasites the parasites that live on the outside of a bird and so this is a picture of a pretty typical ear mite infection of a hooded pitahui. You've probably never seen a bird's ear before, have you? But if you, if you part the feathers with your fingers or blow on its ears, you can part those feathers and hold them back and then, and then look into the ear of a bird. And when you look into a pitahui's ear, you often will see these little red mites and an inflamed infection of them. Um, so ectoparasites are really important class of enemies for birds because they live and they feed and they breed on skin and feathers. And these are the tissues that are very rich in batrachotoxin. They also um, have voltage-gated sodium channels that would be that we would expect would be sensitive to batrachotoxin. So, you know, something like batrachotoxin may be effective. But we also know that ectoparasites have significant fitness effect on birds. They can they've been shown to affect egg number and hatching rate. They can affect mating success because birds with a lot of ectoparasites are really ratty, and no one wants to mate with them. Um, they can also vector important avian diseases. So things like mosquitoes and mites and ticks can carry diseases and can make you very sick or even kill you. Um, and they can also just contribute to the discomfort of birds and that you're constantly spending a lot of time itching and cleaning and preening to get these ectoparasites out. So they can have huge fitness effects. And so if you can get rid of ectoparasites with a toxin like batrachotoxin, that would be a great advantage. So we wanted to explore whether or not the betrachotoxin may be able to act as a chemical defense. And we were able to collect Theraptera lice from birds and do some very simple experiments. Um, and we used feather lice because we could catch a lot of them. We could keep them alive in, in the field in Petri dishes and do some really simple experiments. And so what we did was, um, the first thing you can imagine is the toxin may have an insect repellent type effect. And so what we did was we put two different feathers in a Petri dish, one that was toxic and one that was non-toxic, and we put the louse in there. And every hour or so, we would go in and we would just score which feather the louse was spending its time on and whether the betrachotoxin was able to deter it or, or you know, encourage it to go to the non-toxic feather. And so um, for this first study, uh, we had 105 different lice that participated, and they were given a choice between toxic hooded pitahui feathers and non-toxic control feathers. And these showed a very strong preference against the toxic feather. So that showed very clearly that the toxin can act as an insect repellent. Then we repeated the experiment with the less toxic birds, the rusty and crested pitahui, and we compared them to shrike thrushes. Um, and in that case, we found that there was no impact that, that, that there wasn't enough toxin on the lower toxic birds um, to actually act as an insect repellent. But now if you think about it, most lice, you know, um, even if their host is toxic, they're not gonna jump off because if you jump off, you're toast, right? You're never gonna find another bird to hop onto. And so that's basically suicide. So, you know, not sure that insect repellent is really gonna be an effective method, right? So another thing that you can imagine, it, it might be for some insects like mosquitoes or ticks, but you know, maybe not for lice and, and mites and fleas, things like that. Um, but you can also imagine an insecticide effect. So 
if the if the ectoparasite is on you and it's not going to jump off, but if you're toxic enough that you can um, reduce its lifespan or slow it down enough that it can't do as much harm, maybe that's an advantage. And so we repeated the experiment. And what we looked at was how long did the lice live if they were not given a choice, but only on a non pitahui feather or a rusty pitahui feather that was, non, that was less toxic or a hooded pitahui feather that was very toxic. And what we found was that there's a significant effect in, in how long the lice lived. So that suggests that the toxins are probably helping to kill the lice or at least shorten their lifespan. Um, and that might have an impact. And in that case, even the less toxic rusty pitahui um, seemed to enjoy some advantage um, over the non-toxic feathers. So that was in interesting. So that suggests that the toxin, at least for some ectoparasites, um, can act as an insect repellent, and it may also act as an insecticide. So that was pretty cool to, to see that. But we don't think that that's the whole story because there are a lot of other enemies of pitahuis, but a lot of these are a lot harder to do experiments with. Um, things like green tree python, Boland's python, amethystine python. These are all snakes that specialize on warm-blooded prey like birds, and they're all very good climbers. Um, and we would expect that these would also be susceptible to toxins. Um, another snake, the brown tree snake, this is the snake that was accidentally introduced to Guam and decimated all of the bird populations on, on, on Guam. Um, and this is a snake that's native to the island of New Guinea, something that all birds would have had to co-evolve with and deal with. And so, you know, maybe, maybe Boiga, maybe this brown tree snake is another example of something. And we've done some simple experiments um, by, by um, putting a little bit of vitreka toxin on their typical prey and then seeing how the snakes respond. And we've been able to show that the this, this snakes will still grab the prey and, and bite into it. Um, but then once they realize it's poisonous and they, and they get that burning tingling sensation, then they literally rip the prey back out of their mouth and leave it in the corner of their cage. And they'll, and they'll sit there readjusting their jaws and their mouth becomes so infused in mucus that they're sometimes even blowing bubbles through their own mucus. And so you can tell that they're distressed by it, and that they don't like it. Um, but whether or not it would protect the bird or whether they would end up killing the bird before they realized it, you know, these are all experiments that aren't very ethical to do. So we haven't um, wanted to or been able to do them. Um, but we do think that the toxin probably does affect snakes. And there are lots of other predators too, like, like hawks. There's, there's at least um, eight different hawk species in New Guinea that are large enough to depredate an adult pitahui sized bird. And, um, and many other smaller birds that could, that could depredate nests of pitahuis. And although we've done no experiments with these, um, birds do have the requisite sodium channels and we do expect these birds to be sensitive to toxin and should be affected. Um, and the last class of, of potential predators are human hunters. And perhaps our best evidence comes from human hunters. And humans are very important bird hunters. Young boys get their first bows and arrows when they're very young. Um, and they shoot birds often around the village. In fact, most of the village areas and gardens, the birds are hunted out. And this is, but, you know, the local people all know that pitahuis are, are poisonous and they generally don't hunt them for precisely that reason. In fact, I visited or talked to hunters from over 20 different villages now. And in nearly every locality, the local people recognize that pitahuis are either toxic or that they're taboo and they don't eat them or hunt them for precisely the reason that they're toxic or taboo. So I think that human hunters, you know, they may not be an evolutionary you know, that humans have probably only been around New Guinea for about 50,000 years or so. Um, so they may not be the evolutionary reason, but they may be very important in how well pitahuis are doing today um, because of their toxins. One of the last questions I wanted to try and talk about today is where did the toxins come from? And so I've already hinted that this was one of the holy grail questions that we always wanted to try and figure out. And it was never figured out for the poison dart frogs. They still don't know where betrachia toxins come from for the poison dart frogs. But, you know, these are very, very difficult things to, to try and figure out. Um, and I didn't figure this out, but my friend Avit, who's shown in the lower left here, was the guy who figured this out. So. In 1995, I had a chance to work in this little tiny village that you can see in the very center of the, this photograph called Harawana. And, and Avit is um, kind of a big man in this village. He's not one of the village chiefs or, or, or um, he's not in that sort of royal lineage, but 
he's very entrepreneurial and he built it, that airstrip all by himself. And I was one of the first scientific researchers to come in and work in this village. And Avi was an amazing source of information and friendship and mentoring for me while I was um, living and staying in that village. And when I left, um, after being there for many, many months, I think I was there for, for about eight months, all told, um, you know, you get to be good friends with the local folks. And so when you leave, you leave a lot of stuff behind. You leave backpacks behind and you leave books and paper and pens and vials and you leave ethanol for the first aid post and, you know, all kinds of different things. And, um, and so I left all these things behind. And I, and I had a chance in the early 2000s to go back and visit Avit in the village. And um, when we got there, they said, oh, we're so glad that you came and we knew you'd be back. Um, and while you were away, we figured out where the Pitahui gets its poison. And they had collected, um, they had some of those vials that I had left behind and every one of the vials had insects in it. And, um, and every one of them had written on it, the collector's name, the locality and the date. And this wasn't something that I had asked them to do. They had watched what we did as scientists and they knew that was the information that was important. And um, once they figured out where the toxin was, they wanted to make a collection of them and they wanted to properly document who had done it and how they had done it. And it was just brilliantly done. And I was still very skeptical because I've been to a lot of villages where the local people think they know the answer, but then when we've tested them, there's no betrayca toxin. But when Avit gave us those vials and we tested them for, betray for betrayca toxin, they were full of betrayca toxin. And so he had discovered it. And so when we published the paper, he was the second author. Um, he spoke almost no English, speaks almost no English and only had a second grade education, but it was his study and he was the one who put it all together. And here's the story. So when he was, when he would, after we had left, he had queried some of the elders in the village and they said, well, you know, um, the nanny sanny bird probably gets it from the nanny sanny insect. And when we were in the village, he said, yeah, nanny sanny means bitter bird. But what I didn't realize is that they have many different words for bitter, but nanny sanny actually refers to the specific tingling burning sensation that you get when you taste a feather from the blue capped afrida. And that's how the blue capped afrida got its name in the local village is nanny sanny bird. So they have a little insect that's also called nanny sanny, the nanny sanny beetle. And the local men say, oh yeah, if you are out cutting grass in the field for your thatch roof, um, this beetle will come out of that thatch sometimes. And if it lands on your head and you're, and you're sweaty, the sweat can run down and blind you. And so you've got to be really careful. And so they all know this beetle and they, and they, they know the flavor of it. And they said, yeah, the beetle's really poisonous. And, and, um, and so they, they hypothesized that that might be the source because the, the, the burning tingling sensation is so similar. And when you look at these beetles, um, if you hassle them, they'll curl up into a ball and you can see these little vesicles on the side of the abdomen and prothorax and metathorax. And they'll actually exude a little drop of liquid. And, um, and we think that that might be where the, where the toxin actually is and it is exuded. Um, and they're beautiful little insects. They're only about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and when we did our analyses in the laboratory, we found that the beetles had all of the same toxin compounds in basically the same proportions as the birds. And when we went back through bird stomach contents that we had collected earlier um, over many, many years, we were able to find these little tiny insects in the stomachs. And even though we don't think that this is a major diet item for pitahuis, these beetles are so poisonous that the birds might only need to eat 10 or 15 of them to become fully toxic if they can accumulate all the toxins that are in these beetles. So, um, so again, you know, I get to spend a few months out of, in a good year, I get to spend only a couple months out of a year um, working in a place like New Guinea. And so it's really important that I'm able to work with the local folks because it's their knowledge that I rely on. And many of the best breakthroughs have come from local folks. And that study was really obvious. And, um, we threw a big party for all the folks in the village who had collected all those vials. And, um, and I was able to pay everybody because I knew exactly who had collected all of the, all of the vials and, and who had participated and contributed to that study. So that was one of my, that's still one of my favorite, um, things because I would have never, ever, ever been able to do that by myself. Um, so again, 
the, um, let's just look at our question wheel here. There's, so we've got a little bit on what, what the toxins are. We know a little bit about how they work. Um, we know that they probably get the toxins from insects, maybe these nanny sandy beetles, although it's still possible that the beetles and the birds get it from some other source like a bacteria or a fungus. Um, we know a little bit about how the toxins may have evolved in many different branches, but like I said, that's probably the, talk, the topic of another breakfast club somewhere down the line. Um, and we think that the toxin may function as a defense against maybe parasites, maybe some predators, um, and probably even humans. And um, how are Pitahui's resistant to the toxin? That's something that we're still working on and we're working with folks at, um, at San Francisco, um, at UC San Francisco, um, who are channel, sodium channel experts. And um, we're doing some genetic work on, on those. And we hope to have some answers for you before too long. Um, but there are a lot of great things to study. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we do a lot of other work at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, we do some work on barred and spotted owls. We do work on the evolution of birds and phylogenetics relationships of birds and naming birds. We've also done some work um, describing new viruses, like the one that causes birds' beaks to overgrow, like we see in that lower picture. So we're involved in a lot of different things at the Academy, but the poisonous birds is still one of my very favorite projects. And getting to go to a place like New Guinea um, is such a treat that I always love talking about it. And um, of course, a talk like this is never complete without acknowledging all the different people who contributed to this work. The chemists, John Daly, Tom Spondy from National Institutes of Health. Um, my good friend, Ramona Viznak, who did a lot of the, the Laos work with me. Um, Gopi Menon, who has done a lot of the skin morphology. Um, Megan and Fael, um, who've done a lot of the work with sodium channels um, with me, which, which I didn't talk about here, but um, um, has to do with the resistance to the toxin. Scott Derrickson with the field work. Avit Wako, who um, worked on the nanny sandy beetles with me. Al Samuelson, who did some of the beetle IDs. Um, Rob Fleischer, um, who helped with a lot of the genetics. Um, and Bruce Beeler, who first took me to New Guinea and who's been a longtime collaborator and a great mentor, and Stephen Pruitt Jones, who's also been a great mentor, and all the folks who provided funding. And of course, the island of New Guinea, which is just a magical, magical place um, with lots of inspiration. So thanks so much. That's, I think, all we have time for. But hopefully, I'm happy to stick around and ask questions if folks have any questions. They do. And thank you so much. That was a really incredible presentation. And just the, the way that you laid out the narrative with framing, you know, the questions that you want to answer and how you approach each one. I think there's so many people in comments who just um, are so appreciative of having gotten kind of a different um, understanding of how scientists actually try to answer those questions and create knowledge that's not there yet. So really, really cool. Thank you. Oh, cool. I think, you know, one of the fun things about that is that, you know, usually people get stuck into one field and they always are answering more and more questions about that one thing. And like poisonous birds has forced me to learn chemistry and forced me to learn, you know, yeah. sodium channel biology and um, entomology. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's been, it's yeah. been so much fun. And I think one of the really fun things about science is, is how collaborative it is and, and how, you know, everybody, you know, wants to just put their heads together and, and figure things out. And, and it's just such a fun environment. And, and, you know, all those folks that I mentioned are just so much fun to work with. So Yeah, you're, I mean, I think that's like, there's probably a lot of people are, I know a lot of people are um, surprised to find out that scientists still go on expeditions and do actual exploration and venture into these territories. Um, but also the fact that they have fun doing it is maybe somewhat of a revelation too. So um, let's see, I'm gonna dive into questions now. Um, and let's, uh, let's see, do you, if you need to, if you have a hard stop at any point, you need to go, just feel free to cut us off, but we have a bunch. I'm all yours. Okay, uh, Laura asked, uh, so her question starts out if and how many if and how many complete specimens are collected, um, but then she sums up, how do scientists study highly endangered or scarce species without depleting the population? Yeah, so that's a, those are great questions. We're lucky because pitahuis are very common birds and everywhere we study them, we, that's, that's one thing we don't have to worry about with pitahuis. In fact, the, uh, the local folks um, know that they're very abundant because they don't hunt them. So they're usually very common in gardens and second growth and even scrubby habitats. And in fact, sometimes we don't even go to the rainforest. We'll just go to their gardens um, to, to get what we need. Um, we 
when we first did the work, um, I think we collected about five birds um, that we were able to get enough tissue from to figure out what the toxin was. Um, and then I think we collected about, I think we collected 20 birds in order to figure out how the toxin is distributed in the bodies of birds. So every one of those birds, when we collected it, the feathers were taken and stored separately. The skin was peeled off and stored separately. The, um, the muscle was, was separated and the muscle from different parts of the body were all in different vials. So there was, you know, hundreds of, of vials that we had from those studies and every one of those was assayed for, for toxicity. The unfortunate thing about that is that you don't really have voucher specimens in the traditional sense. So typically when museum folks go to the field, you know, they want a voucher specimen as a documentation of that species in that place and time. And then it goes into a museum forever for people to study. And, and you know, when we did those first studies, we really didn't have a, a voucher in a traditional sense, although we still have, you know, the, those vials and we're still using them for genomic work and for, for stable isotopes and other cool things. So they don't go away. Um, and then, you know, after we realized that a lot of the toxin was in the feathers, it allowed us to go to places where we can't collect or where we wouldn't want to collect. Um, and, 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 and we could study some of the rare species of pitahuis without needing to collect. So that was a really nice thing that we were, you know, so we didn't have to collect more, but I would say too, that, you know, if the collecting is done appropriately, and you know you're not threatening the local populations. You're not collecting so much that you know it would affect the populations. Those specimens end up being very valuable. Um, I've been amazed in in the work that I've done how many people have requested um, the specimens that we have collected from New Guinea because so few people work there. And um, and so many of the specimens that we do have in collections were collected a very long time ago. So there's no tissues. You know, there's no none of the genetic resources that people want today. And so. Um, when we are able to to do a little bit of collecting, um, those end up being very valuable. And it's it's amazing how many papers um, have been published off of that material. And, the, and the, you know, the materials are still there. So, um, so we're constantly battling this, you know, this, this thing that like, we want more because it helps more scientists and it gets more publications out. And we learn so much more, but we don't want to impact, you know, the mm -hmm. populations. So, um, and, you know, for the Pitahui work, I haven't really needed to collect all that many. Mm -hmm. But in so many cases, collecting is also is so is so central to being able to get the data you need to actually protect the place where the animals live or answer these other conservation questions, too. So, yeah, it's a, a big, you know, for people that don't think about collecting a lot, it can be kind of a hard learning because it sounds, you know, a little bit tough sometimes. But like realistically, without that information, there's just no way to actually map out what's needed to protect so many of these places that are left. Right. You know, another statistic that, um, I, I mean, it, it, that I like to, to think about um, is that um, if you look at all the birds in all of the collections worldwide collected through all time, it's fewer birds than cats kill in Wisconsin in one year. Oh, wow. So, you know, yeah. And, and that's not to say that, you know, that makes collecting okay. Right. Um, we always have to be careful. We always have to be careful what we collect and where we collect it and make sure that we're not having undue impacts. But I, but I do think that, you know, sometimes there's a, a little bit more, um, sometimes we, we focus on that because it's easy to focus on and it's easy to get data about. And mm -hmm. we tend to overlook, you know, other ways that we have huge impacts on birds, like the number of birds that are killed by by building strikes every mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. you know, is enormous, and um, and the number of b birds killed by by cats is the is even more enormous. And yeah. these are all things that we could prevent if we just put our mind to it. And it would have you know way more impact to save birds. And mm -hmm. um, and you know, and those collections really do end up being very valuable. And they yeah. and they are very strategic. And if you actually look at the numbers, there aren't that many. So. Right. Yeah, that, that factor really, or that number really puts it in perspective. That's really interesting. Um, let's see. So Bruce asked, I'm trying to pick which one it, um, to send you next, but so Bruce was basically, he was struck by um, how you described just the impact of putting a feather on your mouth from the hooded pitatui and pitatui. Did I say that right? Pitahui, yeah. Pitahui, <laughs> thanks. Um, and so he was, so he, given that he was struck, he asked, how do we understand that lice can tolerate it for some period of time, only having their lifespan shortened? 
did that strike you as well? Would you expect to see more of an impact on the small animal? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, every every animal is affected a little bit differently. And here's another thing to remember is that a, the the lice that we were mostly using in this in the studies came from every bird we could collect them from. So mm -hmm. most of them weren't pitahuis, but those particular lice that feed on pitahuis probably have co-evolved with pitahuis. Mm -hmm. And so they may be resistant to the toxin. Right. So so you always have, you know, this co-evolutionary arms race where, you know, the 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 chemically defended species, you know, gets the chemical, but then the enemies learn how to get around it. And then it becomes more toxic, but then the enemies are able to keep up. Yeah. And, and especially things like parasites, because they have so many more generations for each right. generation of host, they're able to out evolve, you know, or yeah, kind of yeah. like out competing, but they're out evolving. They're, they're able to evolve faster than their, their hosts in many cases. And so, so you can kind of imagine that, yeah, it, it, it may work against naive ectoparasites, but probably the parasites of pitahuis aren't going to be that affected. Um, right. That's really then, interesting. Yeah. So, so that's one thing. The, it, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that the, the feather test, because in the field, it's a very powerful assay. And it's, and it's a very sensitive assay that we can use and it gives us immediate results so that we can have an idea of how toxic the birds are. But people, you know, when we, and we all kind of laugh about it in the field because we're all tasting birds. Yeah. And if, you know, with people, and you know, you talk about it back here and people are like, you're crazy licking birds all the time. But I mean, it really is like one of the, one of the most sensitive assays that we, that we have and mm -hmm. can use and it gives us immediate results. So we, we do it in the field probably more than we should. Yeah, super and, cost effective too. Yep. <laughs> um, Lisa asked, how are your findings shared back with people or institutions in the countries where you study? Well, so um, in New Guinea, there's a there's actually a national research institute and, and we always have to give all of our all of our papers. We have to give an annual report um, to the to NRI. But, you know, how well that gets distributed is a whole other question. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we always send our papers back to the to the villages who've contributed to that work. And, um, and we, you know, we always wanted to share that. Um, and whenever we're in country, we always try and give seminars to the local university. I usually work with the National Museum and Art Gallery. So we usually put together a seminar or two for, you know, folks at the, at the um, museum there. And then they'll invite all of their audiences. And, you know, I think one of the, one of the, the sad things is that, um, you know, we come into the country and we're there for a short amount of time and we work really closely with the local folks in the village where we work. So we get to interact with them a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's just like the campfire banter. You're, in, in fact, the local folks all, they just call it storying. You know, you sit and story um, because there's no radios, there's no television, there's no, you know, now there's actually iPhones, but that's a very new thing. Um, and, and, and culturally, everyone sits around and tells stories. And it's amazing. Like, being being with folks in a place like New Guinea that's so remote and that, you know, literally was living, you know, I mean, you have to realize that it was the 1930s when many of those highland villages first made any contact with the outside world. And so they, they've, in two to three generations, they've come from, you know, the Stone Age um, to, to, you know, having a cell phone in your hip pocket. And, um, and so when you sit around and you talk to the, you know, you sit around the campfire with little kids and the elders, you realize that, that, that like, there's an incredible number of perspectives in the room mm -hmm. and um, in the, in the conversations that we have about science and, you know, and just interworld politics, it's amazing how savvy they are about all the, you know, international politics that, that that's a great place to, to share information and, um, and it's one of the funnest things to do is just sit around with, you know, folks like that. Um, and so whenever we're in the village, we spend a lot of time and that, and that's where we get a lot of our best insights and, and best information and greatest stories. Um, so that's, that's one of the funnest things about working in New Guinea. Um, but, you know, wherever we can, we try and, we try and share that. And, and, you know, we've hosted a lot of students too. Um, so we've, I've had students from the University of Papua New Guinea and at the academy, we have this wonderful fund called the Lakeside Fund, um, which helps support students from New Guinea who want to come to the U.S. and get additional training. And sometimes, you know, we, we've brought students from UPNG. We've brought a couple of them and we've brought the um, 
one of the curators of natural history from the National Museum over to, to work in our collections. And we've been able to teach him some things and give him some, some skills and tools that he didn't have access to before. Um, so those are all, you know, different ways that we can share information and, and, yeah. and try and work together. Yeah, yeah, neat, thank you. Um, so let's see here. So Rob asked, um, and this is kind of related to a question from Tony, but Rob asked, is there any chance this toxin could potentially be used as a model for a natural but effective mosquito repellent for humans? <laughs> and then Tony asked if you think any of the work, your work may have a medical application or impact in New Guinea or elsewhere. Yeah, if, if there have been some studies with mosquitoes and it doesn't look like it's a great repellent. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is if you rubbed it all over your body, you, it, it might keep the mosquitoes away, but you'd be dead. So that would be, oh, really? a, that would be a problem. Um, so, the, so the toxin was first described in the 1970s by the frog researchers and actually by John Daly, who we worked with. So we were, it was very serendipitous that we happened to work with John Daly because probably nobody else in the world would have been able to figure out what the toxin mm -hmm. was so quickly. And, um, and it was immediately um, um, patented by one of the folks who was a co-describer of it. And um, the problem with it is, is that it's so toxic that the, the difference between a medically effective dose and a lethal dose is so small mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's very dangerous. For most things that are drugs, what you want is something that, you know, has a medically effective dose and then, you, you know, it's a... It, it's a much, much, much higher right. dose, like by orders of magnitude higher before it becomes dangerous. And, um, and they did a lot of experimentation with it. It's a, it's a very good analgesic. So it kills pain and numbs tissue very, very quickly, but it's, it's essentially irreversible. That's what that they, they say that it's irreversible. So at, at, you know, if you injected it, like you would use Novocaine, you'd be numb forever. Maybe it'd be like Botox. Oh. Maybe that would be the, that, you know, something that's, you know, similar. So, but, but very, very toxic. And, and so after 25 years of it's being patented, they, they let the patent lapse. So right now there's no, you know, there's no patent um, law that, that covers it. That said that um, it's also a very large chemical that's very hard to, to make. And so until very recently, there's actually a researcher at Stanford who's figured out a synthesis for it but it's still very costly and, and very hard to make. So they, they're able to make it, but it's only used for, for channel research um, for, for folks who study sodium channels and things like that. Um, okay. So, so it's, it's not going to be useful as a, as a medicine anytime soon. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm going to ask, I'll just ask you a handful more. Um, Lynn wanted to clarify whether the toxicity levels um, found with a hoodie and variable pitahuis are so high that they could act as an immediate defense against an individual predator attacking the animal. So would it let go essentially instead of teaching predators over time to avoid it? Right. That's a really good question. And it's one of the things that like, we're, we're not sure how to design studies that could really get at that question. Mm -hmm. um, but, but here's our, here's my thinking on it. I, I, I sort of imagine that, you know, if it's a, there are some predators that will attack and kill first and then taste. And for those, you're just in trouble. And, you know, it, it might learn and your offspring might do better or your mate might survive because it, it learned to avoid you. But, you know, it's not going to help you. Um, there are other ways that it might actually help. So if you think about, you know, we were just handling the bird and got enough of it on our on our hands from holding the feathers to if you rub your eyes or your nose it'll it'll tingle and burn um and so you can imagine a, a pitahui that might have a nest with two eggs in it and if it's sitting on those eggs and a lot of birds will even line their nest with some of their own feathers mm -hmm. and so you can kind of imagine that it probably gets enough toxin on the eggs or maybe on the chicks that are in the nest that if a predator came along and like a snake was tongue flicking, for example, mm -hmm. it, it might taste it and say, oh, no, thank you. You know, or it might even like eat one of the young and begin to eat it. And very much like we saw when we fed it a little pinky mouse, you know, then it like realizes, oh my gosh, this was not something that I really wanted to eat. And then it rips it out of its mouth and leaves it in the corner. Um, and so if it did that to a nest, then the other nestlings might end up surviving. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, normally all three would be eaten or both would be eaten. And in this case, you know, maybe they would, they would live. Um, the other thing that's interesting is this, that 
we, for many, many years, tried to find nests of pitahuis, and we just never timed it right because, you know, El Nino and the seasonality is all really weird. You can't predict when birds are going to be breeding there. And so we've just always missed it or we've not been able to find nests. But there was a, a nest described. And um, one of the things that they, that they found was that the young were brightly colored. So they had that orange and black plumage, which is very atypical. Typically in, in nests, you know, that the young are pretty drab. And if they have any bright in, at all, it's like on the inside of their mouth so that the parents can aim when they're regurgitating food. And, um, and so, so that suggests that maybe the young are poisonous and, you know, or that they get enough poison from their parents to, that, that predators will remember them. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they found was that there were at least, I think it was at, at least three and maybe as many as five different adults feeding the young. So another thing that often happens with poisonous things is they tend to be gregarious or cluster in social groups. And if you think about it, if you, if you cluster in a family group and one of your family gets picked off, but you train the predator to not eat you, then the rest of the family survives in the genes that that family has end up doing better than the genes that that aren't protected or that aren't chemically defended. And so there have been papers published that suggest that gregariousness might be, you know, an important thing to have if you're going to be chemically defended or gregariousness is selected for if you're chemically defended or if you're gregarious, chemical defense might evolve. So those things tend to be correlated. And um, so, so that all makes sense. So even if it doesn't protect you as an individual, it may protect your family in the form of your offspring or your, your, you know, your other family mates that help um, raise young. Right. Wow. Okay. So the egg question, because this is something that um, Krishna asked, sounds like it still needs to be answered, whether, whether it does actually confer enough toxicity to protect the eggs themselves. Yeah, we don't know because we've never been able to find right. um, a nest, but but we'd love to find, you know, a, a nest with eggs and swab the eggs and see how toxic they are. Or conversely, you know, maybe you could, um, you know, you could take a, a bird's nest and rub some toxins on it and just see how mm -hmm. it affects predators. You know, these are, they're, I'd say that, I, so I always have envy of people who study insects and who've studied butterflies and butterfly toxicity because you can catch hundreds of butterflies and release them and do these experiments. You can't collect a hundred pitahuis and go releasing them and make some of them poisonous and non-poisonous and then see what predator, you know, like nobody would let you do that, nor would you want to do that with a bunch of birds, you know? So, so I'd say that, you know, doing these kinds of experiments can be very difficult to do. And, and with large birds, like pitahuis, you know, it, when we go to a place, we might be running nets for a week before we catch a single pitahui. They're, they're out there, but you know, and they're, and they're common, but they're not that easy to get. And, and they don't respond to calls. They're not territorial like, like some other birds. In fact, they're very gregarious and they flock in mixed species flocks. And, and a lot of other birds hang out with them. So, you know, so we, so unfortunately, we really don't know. And, and honestly, I'm not sure that it's something that we're going to be able to do effective experiments with immediately. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'll tell you one other thing, though, that's kind of cool is that um, the Pitahuis have a very strong smell, too. So we always think of like aposematism as being bright coloration. Um, but there's lots of ways to be aposematic or to stand out or be memorable is really what you want, right? And when, um, if somebody's been out at the nets and they're like, oh, I've got two birds and one of them's a pitahui, all you have to do is go, you know, be like, that's the pitahui. Cause you can, it's so strong. And I wouldn't say that it's a, it's malodorous or unpleasant smell, but it's a very unusual smell. And I don't even know how to describe it cause I don't know of anything else that smells like it. But that's exactly what you want to have if you if you want to have your smell be remembered and 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 associated with the bad experience that you had you know with eating something and it smelled bad and it's like i'll never eat that thing again right, right? and and that's a very visceral response that that we have that animals have towards food and associating bad food with with an odor and um and you can also imagine that a lot of the types of predators that eat birds are mammals that climb in trees, you know, tree climbing rats and tree climbing possums mm -hmm. and things like that, that will, if they encounter a bird nest at night, will, will raid it. And so, you know, having an aposematic smell is going to be very useful for those things that are active at night and can't see as well. 
Okay. Can you define aposematic just for folks that are, well, for me included? Yeah. So, um, it's, so an aposematic color or an aposematic signal is, is one that is associated with, with something that's distasteful or, or poisonous. And so, so in, in it, it's not a protection in itself, but it's something that helps the predator remember and associate with that bad experience. Oh, okay, so, great. That's so, a very so handy if, word. Yeah. So, so if you think of things like warning coloration, mm -hmm. you know, scientists tend to call it aposematic coloration instead of warning coloration. Um, but okay. it, it's really the same thing. Yeah, great. And now we can call it that too. Um, Andy said, I think you originally, I think you said that you originally thought these birds were the only poisonous birds in the world. Uh, what are the others? So we did think these were the only poisonous birds in the world. And we actually published that in, in our first paper, which was in science. And we said something like, you know, the, this is the first example of a poisonous bird. And you never do that in a scientific <laughs> paper because you will get busted back. And we did. And so, um, so several people wrote in and said, oh, well, you know, this bird is poisonous or that bird is poisonous. And, you know, we looked them up and, and some of them were just super obscure and not well supported, but others were really well supported and had a long history, um, mm -hmm. but not part of the ornithological, you know, knowledge in general. So, and I love telling some of these stories. So the oldest poisonous bird was first reported in the Bible. And the story was that as Moses was in exile and going through the desert, God gave them manna, but people got sick of eating manna and they wanted meat. And so God gave them quail, but told them, don't eat too many quail or I will strike you down. And a lot of people died from eating quail. And to this day, people still die from eating quail um, in that part of the world. And also in Northern Algeria, Southern France, parts of the Soviet Union, but it's just at a certain time of year and on certain flyways. And, um, and it, apparently the quail will pick up some toxins that they're eating and no one's figured out what the toxin is. Um, and it makes them sluggish so you can walk right over to them and pick them up. So unfortunately, the easier they are to catch, the more dangerous they are to eat. Right. Um, but, but, you know, this is well known in the medical literature. Um, That's another. Funny. Another cool example is our North American parrot. The Carolina parakeet was supposedly poisonous. And Alexander Wilson wrote about this in his book, American Ornithology. And John James Audubon, the painter, had a copy of, Audubon, of, um, of Wilson's book when he was traveling down the Ohio River to the Mississippi in 1820 and 21. So if you read Audubon's journals, he talks about calling into a little um, village um, where the Native American people all told him, oh yeah, that's that's true what Wilson said, that the Carolina parakeets are poisonous. And so he, so Audubon in his journal talks about how he waited for his dog Dash to have pups and he collected enough Carolina parakeets to feed one to every one of the pups and to Dash. And he never reports what what happened with his experiment. But Dash, who was a pretty big player in the journal up to then, is never mentioned again. So. Audubon uh, may, may have killed his dog by feeding him Carolina parakeets. And, yeah. and the, the very first mention of the Carolina parakeets being poisonous is, um, is in Catesby's Natural History of Florida and North Carolina and the Bahamas, which is the first published book on North American biota. And, um, and we have a copy at the Academy. So it's really cool. I was able to like flip through that book and look at that page where he talks about, yeah, it says the Carolina parakeets according to the local people, have a sure and fatal poison for cats. Oh, wow. And, well, um, regardless of the outcome, I think we can agree that Audubon did not deserve Dash. So we'll just no, put that in fact, the scientific record. <laughs> in fact, if you read his journals, he was he clashed with a lot of people along the way. He, he mm. didn't seem like a fun guy to go on an expedition with, but, mm. you know, but we love his paintings anyway. Yeah. And that, those birds are, are extinct now, is that right? Yes. So we'll okay. never know whether they were right. poisonous. And mm -hmm. Even Alexander Wilson did an experiment to see if they were poisonous. And when his pet Carolina parakeet died, he, they, he fed it to his cat. And, um, but his cat didn't die. And he, he, but he says, yeah, but the, but the, you know, the, the local lore is, is that the Carolina parakeets become poisonous by eating cockleburs. And he said, because mine was a pet, I fed it corn. So it would have never been able to get poisonous. So, so we still don't know whether the Carolina parakeet was actually poisonous or what the poisonous, what, or what the poisons were, if it was poisonous, but that's kind mm -hmm. of a, 
but those are cool examples. And there's, there's, there's a handful of other examples out there in the literature with, that are really fun to talk about. Okay. They, I mean, yeah, it's amazing that, that you can find clues and stories going that far back. Um, not amazing, but it's, it's very cool to hear those stories. And, and if anyone's really interested, if you go to my website, which is jackdumbacher.com, all of my publications are, are there. And, um, and one of them is a paper from 1996 where we took all the, all the different suggestions that people wrote to us and we researched as many others ourselves and we compiled them all into a review paper about poisonous birds and what other birds are poisonous. And there's other ways to be chemically defended. You don't have to be poisonous. You can just taste really bad or you can <laughs> smell really bad. And so there are birds that do that too. So that's a fun read. So check it out if you. Okay, we'll drop the. Um, yeah, we will. Sorry to interrupt. We'll drop the link to your website in the comment section, and I'll do two more. One from Danielle, who just wanted to settle the question: Are there? So we've been talking about poisonous birds. Are there actually any venomous birds? Not that I know of. Okay, not yet. You can put that in the next paper. Yeah. Um, clearly stating that there are not, and then we'll find out for sure. <laughs> that's <laughs> one way to get everybody to weigh in. Right. Um, and then as a last question, this one from Christopher, um, now that you know the source of the toxin, or or perhaps now, I guess, it just sounds like it's not entirely conclusive, but um, what do you consider the next biggest question that needs answering with these birds? So that, and the thing that I'm working on right now is how do the birds not get poisoned by their own toxin? Oh, yeah. And so, so that is the, in, in fact, we've sequenced the entire Pitahui genome. Oh. And we've assembled um, each one of the sodium channel genes, there are 10 of them, the sodium, sodium channel beta and alpha subunits. And this is kind of crazy, but you can actually, if you have the sequence, you can just order it from a lab and they'll have an expression vector, a little bacteria that's expressing the, betray the, um, the sodium channels. And then, and then you can do your experiments to see how the how the sodium channels react to, to betrachia toxin. So we've got um, a, a handful of those channels in the lab at UC San Francisco, where they're studying them to try and figure out if they are insensitive and if they're not insensitive and how they're insensitive. And it's also pointing to that, you know, that may not be the only way or the only um, tools that that birds and other animals have to avoid toxins. And so there's some other things that animals can do to to package them maybe and move them safely to, to places in the body where they won't do any damage, but not break down the, the chemicals. So right. you know, our, our livers also will, when we eat a lot of things that are poisonous, our, our liver can break down a lot of those toxins, but then they're detoxified, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can't use them for defense. Mm -hmm. so, what, so what's happening with pitahuis and betrachia toxins is, is very different. And you know, what, what poison dart frogs do with toxins is very different. Mm -hmm. And so I think the pitahuis are giving us some insight into what frogs may be doing too. And so our collaborators are, are working on some of those things. That's one of the things I'm very interested in and we're working on right now. Okay, great. Well, we'll, we'll uh, stay tuned for that. And I heard you reference future breakfast clubs several times in your talk. So we'll have to hold you hold you to that too, even though we know that we'll, we're gonna make you come on again probably before the findings of your current work come out. Um, sure, so I'm always happy to come back. Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Breakfast Club viewers, we have a, another one this Thursday on the third, which will be Scorpions 101, everything you always wanted to know about Earth's most maligned arachnids from Dr. Lauren Esposito, our curator of arachnology. She's and then, awesome, so definitely tune in. That'll be a okay. good one. That Jack, Jack Dumbacher endorsed uh, episode. That's this Thursday. And then um, next Thursday, you will have a chance to meet our brand new botany curator, Dr. Sarah Jacobs, for the very first time. And she is going to introduce us to the wild world of parasitic plants. So don't miss that one either. Um, and as a last note, I'll just say that we um, are now entering our sixth month of closure. And um, that's like museums everywhere, has hit the academy particularly hard. So if you are able to comfortably give, we would be so grateful for any amount. We have a donation link on the YouTube description and a button on the Facebook page. But if you're not able to comfortably do that, please just keep tuning into these um, episodes and engaging with us. And that's absolutely great. We so appreciate that as well. Um, so with, with that, I'll say thank you, Jack, again so much. Yes, um, thank you all for tuning in. And thanks for all that you do as members and supporters and fans of the Academy. We really appreciate it. It's only because of you that we get to do what we do. So thank you all so much. Yeah, well said. Thanks, Jack. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.